How are we doing? That bad, huh? All right. Well, I had uh, something awkward happen to me. Um, I'd like to say it was something. This is probably one in a litany of awkward things that have happened to me in my life that play on repeat about midnight every night. Um, but I had something awkward happen to me at Taco Joint. Uh, my family is the frequenters of the taco joint, and we were there uh, one evening for dinner, and I noticed as I was going to get a refill on my drink that there was a group of young adults who were uh, looking at the plastic menus in their hands, and usually for me as a regular, uh, that's usually an indication that they don't know, they've never been here before. So I was trying to be helpful, and I was going to walk up to them and say, hey, can I offer some recommendations? And right as I did that, rather than walking up to the whole group, one of the women in the group, one of the young ladies, turned in such a way that I really only walked up to her. <laughs> yes, you see where this is going. So I walked up to her and I said, hey, have you ever been here before? And she was very uncomfortable and said yes once or twice. And I proceeded with no exit strategy to give her my recommendations anyway and then walk away back to my table where I was greeted by the most horrified look I've ever seen on my wife's face ever. <laughs> To which she then said, rightfully so, what was that? <laughs> and head in my hands, I responded with, I don't know. I was just trying to be helpful. And I came across really, really awkward. My wife pointed out later that it was like the insurance commercials where the guys training the people how to not be like their parents. She was like, I need to send you to that program. Like, they didn't ask for your help. They didn't, nobody needs your help, Travis. They can order tacos on their own, right? <laughs> but I was misunderstood. And that's, that's really the, the key point that I want you to remember. I'm not weird. I was just misunderstood. And I think many of us are scared to be misunderstood. I think it's one of the reasons why we're perhaps not as helpful as we want to be. I think it's one of the reasons why we're maybe not as encouraging, why we don't want to tell people genuinely how we feel about them. We don't want to be misunderstood. And I can't think of a single uh, uh, being in the universe who's more misunderstood than God. We misunderstand his uh, plans, his person, his character all the time. We take what he does and we think to ourselves, what are you doing in my life, Lord? Surely you wouldn't mean this. Surely this is not the way things were supposed to go. We misunderstand him all the time. And so what I want us to do today is I want us to talk about how uh, not dealing with these misunderstandings create barriers to us growing in our relationship with Christ. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 4. Uh, we're going to start in verse 8 and go through the end of the chapter. And I want us to see the danger that misconceptions present, the deceptions that they offer us, and then the decision we need to make regarding them. So let's start with the danger. The danger that we face is a call to retreat. The danger is retreating. Verse 8, formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid I may have labored over you. In vain. Paul's returning to his argument and basically saying, look, you all are going back into enslavement. You Galatians are going back into enslavement of, of practicing uh, uh, elementary principles of the world underneath the law. And what he's saying is these Galatian uh, believers came out of a pagan background. They came from uh, paganism, and now a group of, of people from Jerusalem called the Judaizers have come up from Jerusalem and said, hey, wait a minute, you guys need to be Jewish so that you can become Christian, or Judaism is some part of the, the process of becoming a believer. So they're telling them to get circumcised. And we'll talk about why that is and why it's such an attractive offer to them uh, at, uh, later on today. But what Paul is saying then, the summation of his message thus far has been, that's not a step forward. It's a step back. If you do this, if you go this route, you're not growing in Christ, you're actually taking a step back. And what's startling about this is that he essentially equates life under the law, the law that God gave, with a law, life under paganism, which is mind-blowing when you think about it. Paganism was man-made, was perhaps demon-inspired, I mean, all sorts of stuff. We can get into debates about all that. But the law we know was given by God. 
Moses was on Mount Sinai. He was given the law. Remember he broke it, right? There's the joke that Moses was the first person to ever download uh, things uh, onto a tablet from the cloud um, (laughs) because God was giving him things onto a tablet, right? And so we know that came from God. And Paul, what? how are they the same thing? They're not even remotely the same things. And Paul's saying, no, they're the same in one really, really important reason. They get you to the same place. They don't get you anywhere closer to God than you were before. Paganism, if you follow a pagan culture, false religion, whatever, it's going wind to wind, lead you to the exact same spot as life under the law, trying to earn your salvation, trying to earn God's favor, trying to earn good works, same thing, it's going to leave you far away from God. And he outlines how they are similar. First, he says that worship of God under the law and worship of a pagan God are misconceptions about who God is. Yeah, there are some things about pagan gods that you'd be like, oh, that's kind of like, that's kind of like Yahweh. That's kind of like Jesus, right? Yeah, there's similarities. Sometimes there are. But if I tell you that I follow Jesus... And I tell you that Jesus has told me to love people, to be generous to people. You'd be like, okay, yeah, that sounds like the Jesus I worship. But then if I told you Jesus has also commanded me that every sixth day I have to walk on my hands, you'd be like, now hold up. What Jesus have you been listening to? It's in the book of Hezekiah, by the way, just in case you're wondering. That's not a real book. I'm teasing. (laughs) It's not a book of Hezekiah. Calm down. You'd be like, that's not the same Jesus. You can give something the same name and it not be the same thing. This is what the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, have done as well. They say they worship the same Jesus that we do, and it's not. Their understanding of Jesus is very different than Orthodox Christianity. And so Paul talks about that. He also talks about returning to the elementary practices of the world. This is rudimentary understanding of the way the world works. And he's saying you're not going, uh, taking a step forward. You're taking a step back. You're going back to world 101, not world 2.0, underneath the gospel and God's full fleshed out plan for human society. Paul also reminds them of the slavery that they had to festivals and religions, which festivals sound pretty cool, but there was a lot of festivals. There was a lot. You basically interrupted your life to go do these religious things, both in Judaism and under the law, or, or sorry, in paganism. Whole civilizations would stop. There's one festival in Judaism where you took a whole week off and lived out of a booth or a tent. Or you just abandoned your house for a week to live in a tent. Some of you call that camping, and you think that sounds really nice. For those of us with really smooth hands, no, that sounds awful. <laughs> Based on what Paul says in verse 11, he is really worried that they're returning to a life of essentially paganism under the heading of following the law. They're going back. They've misunderstood the gospel. They've misunderstood what God's intentions are, and they're retreating. They're falling back. And this is a huge, normal danger that you face. When you misunderstand something, whether it's God or something in your life, you try to go back to the point when you understood the way the world worked. You try to go back to when you were comfortable. You try to go back to when things made sense. It's a perfectly natural thing to do. But often we wind up overcorrecting. Often we wind up misconceiving what God has done, and so we overcorrect. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you sign up to be a a, a greeter here at the church. You feel like God's moved in your heart, and you're like, hey, I want to serve. I'm going to go be a greeter. And so you go see Whitney, who you just saw up on stage earlier, and you say, hey, I want to serve, and I want to be a greeter. And she gives you a t-shirt, she gives you a lanyard, and she assigns you a door. And so for week in, week out, you're right there at the door, and you're waving. You're like this. You're like, hi, welcome. Maybe you don't wave like that, because that'd be weird. But you, 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 you're there, and you're on fire, and you're loving it. But one morning, you wake up, and you're like, ah, I'm just not feeling it today. Just feel kind of tired, kind of run down. Or maybe God has ordained that every person who is having a bad Sunday morning is going through your door that day. And so when you do your little wave, and you're like, hi, and they're like, mm. And you're like, well, this kind of stinks. This isn't super encouraging. This is super draining. And so rather than saying, you know what, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to take a couple weeks off. I just kind of need to recharge. You go to Whitney, you hand in your shirt, you hand in your lanyard, and you say, I misunderstood what God was doing, and you take a break, but for like six years. Because that's what we do. We overcorrect. We overcorrect. Anytime that we experience discomfort, we tend to overcorrect because we think, and this is one of the most common misconceptions that we have about God. We think if we're uncomfortable, 
then God is not working in our life or that God is not leading us in the right direction or that we've misunderstood what God is doing. Because we think, oh my gosh, if God really wanted this for me, I would be happy, I would be comfortable, I'd be successful, I'd be satisfied. And that's a misunderstanding of how God works. That's a misunderstanding of who he is. This is how the Judaizers were convincing the Galatians, grown men, to undergo circumcision. Because in the old, uh, uh, in Christianity, they were not allowed to worship idols, right? There was even rules about them eating meat sacrificed to idols. And, what, what, uh, and so they were removed from society. They were super ostracized because it wasn't a government-sanctioned religion. But these Judaizers are coming up from Jerusalem and saying, hey, look, if you become kind of a Jewish-Christian hybrid, you can call yourself Jewish, and guess what's going to happen? You don't get persecuted anymore. You can live a comfortable life. You can still follow Jesus. Just everybody's going to think that you're Jewish, and you get out of it. And so he's offering comfort. Just because you're uncomfortable doesn't mean you've misunderstood God's plan. Often God uses challenges, trials, difficulty, discomfort, to shape us, to mold us, to make us more like Christ. That's the whole thing that Catherine and Jack were talking about with grief share. Catherine will tell you that her grief is shaping her and molding her. It's drawing her closer to Christ. It's uncomfortable, sure. When your marriage gets hard or when singleness gets hard or when your job gets tough, you can't turn around and walk away. You've got to keep going. When things get no longer life-giving, you got to hang in there. When church life gets daunting, and believe me, it does. I've been doing this since I was seven. Not preaching. That would be strange. <laughs> I have been in church since I was a kid. I think it's hard sometimes. It's not always life-giving. I wish I could say it was. you got to keep going. you got to stick with the body of believers. When your struggle against addiction feels like it's just winning the day. It's, it, it's impossible to overcome. You've got to keep going. You've got to keep putting one foot in front of the other. You've got you to keep uh, fighting that thing. When your mental illness, you're struggling with depression, anxiety, whatever it is, you can't give up. You've got to keep going. You've got to keep going. So how do you do this? How do you deal with that? How do you handle these misconceptions? Well, first, and this is super cliched, and I know it is, but it's really important, I'll explain why. You need to be praying. You've got to be praying. When my wife and I have a misunderstanding, one of the worst ways to exacerbate said misunderstanding is to not talk. If we have a misunderstanding in the morning and then don't talk until the evening, guess what it's like coming home? It's not roses. Because we've had all this time to, to be in our thoughts and to think about, well, what did she mean by this? And what did he, why did he do that? And all this stuff. When you don't talk to God about the misconceptions you have about him, it just festers. Tell him that you're not happy. Tell him that you're not satisfied. Tell him that you want to quit your job. Tell him that you want to quit your marriage. Be like, Lord, this is what I want to do. I need help. I need you to rescue me. This is not what I thought you had for me. Help. You got to talk to him about it. Every Christian needs prayer, and it is a misconception to think that you don't. Secondly, you need to simplify. And this is something that's been going on in my own life. Uh, I've just been in a really dry season uh, spiritually, just not really getting a lot out of scripture, not getting a lot out of prayer. And it's been going on for a while. It's been a few months, actually. I started off the year really strong, and then it just is kind of, I don't want to say it's tailspin, but it's just kind of downward slope kind of thing. And so one night this week, um, I was praying, and uh, I was reading, and I got to Psalm 50. And Psalm 50 is about all the things that the Israelites are trying to do to worship. And God's like, yeah, it's just not, it's not working. And then he says something in Psalm 50, verse 14. He says, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the most high and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. And I thought, wow, that's really simple. Offer thanksgiving, keep your vows cry out to God for help and give him glory. I was like, that's like four things. That's super simple. I was like, does my life need to be more simplified? And so I kind of started going through my life, and I think God kind of led me through this, where, where I was kind of thinking about what are the things I need to do every day? Every day to kind of just simplify things down. My, my time with the Lord had been, become really complicated. I had like a commentary, and I was trying to script out different prayers. It was very obtuse. 
uh, kind of thing. And so I came upon three things that I need to do every day just to kind of reset. The first was I like to stay up late. I'm a night owl. And I was, felt like the Lord was like, Travis, you need to go to bed. Like you just need to start going to bed a little earlier and get your rest. Okay, cool. I take anti-anxiety medication and I had been inconsistent with that. I need to make sure I'm taking that every single day. And then I need to be in the word and prayer every single day, but not to the extent that I was doing. I need to simplify it. I need to, to just be reading. And if there's something I have a question about, I can go to a commentary, but I really just need to simplify what I'm doing. And because I'm a preacher and a pastor, I made these things rhyme so that I would remember them. And these are, this is the rhyme. I need bed, meds, and bread. Those are my three things. And I would encourage you to simplify. That's not a retreat. You're just stripping things down so you can sail a little bit faster and a little bit smoother. And then you can start adding things in later. But if things are uncomfortable, don't fall back, don't retreat. Simplify just a little bit, okay? All right, let's talk about the other danger. And this is a little bit more subtle. And it's deception through flattery deception through flattery. Look at verse 12. This is a bit longer, so hang with me. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that, if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not only when I'm present with you. My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Paul does change his tone. He goes from a a logical argument to what the Greeks called like a a pathological argument, the argument based on passion, pathos. And he goes back to their relationship and how their relationship was formed and how they were so close and something in the relationship is broken. Paul's saying in the, in the, uh, in the beginning, he showed up to Galatia with a physical ailment. Now we don't know what this is. Some people think it had something to do with his eyesight because he talks about the gouging out of eyes. Um, Other people think that he was just sick. What I read this week and I really liked and made a lot of sense to me was that Paul takes an absolute beating on his missionary journeys. And in Lystra, which is a Galatian city, he was stoned almost to death and was cast outside the city to die, and he survived. But it's possible that he showed up to some of the cities in Galatia scarred, beaten, bruised, and bloody. And they welcomed him in, which is very odd. Because in that culture, in that time, if you had uh, illnesses, if you had disabilities, if you had problems, you were considered to be cursed by the gods. And so people would shun you. Scars were a sign of God's disfavor. And so that's, I think, one of the reasons why he goes to this strange idiom of, of gouging out the eyes. Because he's saying, essentially what we would say is, you would have cut off your right arm for me. Like, you would have given me your arm if you could. It's the same kind of idea. But now something's broken in their relationship. Whereas they went and and absorbed him and and, and took him in and and nursed him back to health. Guess what? He's not doing that now. They're looking down on him. They believed the gospel so much, probably because of his injuries. Why are they turning away? It tells you in verse 16. Paul says this, Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. Making much of them. They're flattering them. They're telling them what they want to hear. They're flattering them. The Judaizers have come up from Jerusalem looking all pristine and saying, look, you don't have to go through the stuff that Paul went through. All you have to do is go through circumcision, become kind of Jewish Christian hybrid things, and you're going to be fine. It's going to be okay. That's what they want to hear. They want to hear that things don't have to be so hard. All of this is wrapped around some kind of a pursuit of them. And this is one of the ways, again, that we misunderstand ourselves and we misunderstand what God is doing. Because we don't get convinced of logic or reason. We get convinced when people tell us things that we want to hear. We're all familiar with flattery, right? All of us have kids, uh, or we know what it's like when a kid's sucking up to us, right? To, to be like, hey, 
I know what you want. I know you want that thing at Target. And just, you're being really nice. Good job. But I'm not falling for it this time. Or like your, your employees, they laugh at you and laugh at your jokes. Maybe not laugh at you, but laugh at your jokes because they work for you. This is the best thing about having residents, man. Like they have to laugh at everything <laughs> because if they don't, I'm going to give them in trouble. So it's really nice. Thank you. That chuckle, I felt very, very, very loved, very flattered. Thank you. But we're always on guard against interpersonal flattery. But what about corporate flattery? What about corporate flattery? There's advertisements that are designed to flatter you. They're actually called flattering advertisements, where they say things like, hey, you know a good deal when you see one. Or hey, you're a smart consumer. That's a flattering advertisement. Makes me think that I'm really smart. I really know what I'm doing, right? There's other advertisements that are like that. I saw a Gatorade commercial, um, and I want to say it was recently. It was not. Uh, it, it's a while back. Uh, but Gatorade's slogan, is it in you, right? And I saw this commercial where Michael Jordan, old Michael Jordan, is playing like young Michael Jordan, and they're like really like going at it. It's like amazing technology stuff. And so anyway, at the end, they're both sweating, and they're drinking Gatorade, and they say, like, is it in you? you know? and, and, and the idea is, if you want to be a championship caliber player like Michael Jordan, you need to make sure that Gatorade is in you. That's the explicit thing. But we also know when you're watching one of the greatest basketball players of all time, there's a subtle implication there, too, which is, do you have what it takes to be as good as him? Is that in you? And we all want to say, yeah, I've got that. I've got that in me. Or what about political flattery. We're always told by candidates, I'm going to go to Washington or I'm going to go to Austin and I'm going to, I'm going to change things. I'm going to do this. I'm going to... You might be flattering yourself at how quickly things can change, right? The system is actually designed not to change quickly. I would be really excited about a candidate that was like, why don't we just take a break and keep things the same for like two years, just so we can catch our breath. We'll catch up later. But let's just relax, right? Everybody just calm down. It's okay. Flattery. It's all over the place. And the sinister thing about it isn't just that we like it, we want it. John Chrysostom, early church father, said this, I do not know whether anyone has ever succeeded in not enjoying praise. And if he enjoys it, he naturally wants to receive it. And if he wants to receive it, he cannot help but being distraught at losing it. Those who are in love with applause have their spirits starved, not only when they are blamed offhand, but even when they fail to be constantly praised. Wow. We love flattery. We love praise. And we're willing to ignore the dangers that come from it. Many of us are willing to mortgage the truth of our faith just so some people will think nice things about us and say nice things about us. That's true. Because flattery is lying. That's what it is. And lying is a distortion of reality. That's what a lie is. You are trying to convince somebody that reality is different than the way that it really is. And the thing about flattery is that it is a distortion of one of the most important realities in your life, your understanding of who you are. That's what flattery does. It distorts the image that you have of yourself. It happened to uh, Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.5. Serpent shows up, tells them if they eat the fruit that God has forbidden them to eat, you can be like God. And the implied flattery is you deserve to be like God. You can handle being like God. It's not that hard. You're made in his image. You can do it. And we have been buying into that flattery ever since. Flattery inflates, misshapes, and distorts who we are, how we perceive ourselves, and how we think the world perceives ourselves. It's like a funhouse mirror that makes us look smarter, Funnier, sexier, prettier, whatever you want to be is what flattery does. And if you don't have an accurate perspective of who you are, if you're not humble, you can become proud, arrogant, conceited, particularly if your image of yourself is fueled by flattery. What flattery does is it makes us misunderstand ourselves. And I don't know how in the world you would ever figure out what God wants to do in your life if you don't understand who and what you were created to be. If you think that you were created to do and be something over here that's been inflated by flattery your whole life and God's way, wants way over here, you're, those things are never going to line up because you won't believe his word, but you'll believe the words of other people, right? Flattery is so dangerous. So how do we fight it? Well, we need to deal with it the same way that Jesus dealt with flattery in his life, right? He didn't trust it, for one. But you see what Satan tries to do in Luke chapter 4. He gives him three temptations, and of the three, two of them are implied cases of flattery. One of them, he's going to offer him all the kingdoms of the world, 
And Jesus is like, no, and he offers him back some scripture. But the implied flattery, again, is you can handle it. You can do it. The third uh, temptation, he's going to have Jesus throw himself off the temple, and God's going to save him. The Father's going to come to his rescue. Again, the implication being that your Father loves you so much, he values you so much, he'd never let anything happen to you. It's flattery. It's all flattery. And Jesus combats it with the truth of Scripture. Look, I go to Scripture when I'm hurting. I go to Scripture when I'm struggling. And it's there for me. It truly is. But sometimes we need to go to Scripture and let it criticize us constructively. We need to go and read the Bible and expect God every once in a while, maybe more often than every once in a while, to say, Travis, you're off here. You're misunderstanding yourself right here. This is not who I created you to be. That's called conviction. And the Spirit of God does it in us. You've got to have truthful conversations with yourself. You've got to have truthful conversations with other people. And you certainly have to have truthful conversations with the Bible. If the Bible says everything you want it to and says exactly what you want to hear all the time, guess what? You might not be reading the Bible. You might be reading your own thoughts put in on top of the Bible, which is dangerous. It's why you've got to read the Bible in community. It's why we need other people. Norman Vincent Peale, who's the father of modern positive thinking, by the way, which is ironic, said, the trouble with most of us is that we'd rather be ruined by praise than saved by criticism. That is so true. I love praise. Everybody does, right? Y'all, we have got to be willing to be criticized. Have an honest conversation with people that are close to you. Maybe one or two people and just say, I give you permission to tell me the truth at any time. Give people that power in your life. Let them criticize you constructively and trust them with it. Make certain that they love the Lord. Make certain that they're, what they say is held up to Scripture, but let people criticize you. It's a nice counterweight to that flattery that we all get all the time. So what do we do? How do we respond to all these misconceptions? Well, we have a decision to make, and it's one of removal. So Paul changes his argument again. And this time he uses an illustration, an example from the Old Testament, which I'm not going to read, but I'm going to try and explain to you because we just don't have as much time as I'd like. So Paul brings up Abraham and Sarah, and they've been promised by God, you're going to have a son, and this son is going to be the child of promise. And this child is going to, uh, all the promises that have been made, they're going to be uh, sort of fulfilled in him, and he's going to continue on this, this promise. And so Abraham and Sarah are like, great God, that sounds awesome, let's help you out with this. And so Sarah gives Abraham her slave, Hagar, he sleeps with her, and they have a son named Ishmael. And God's like, guys, great job, that's exactly, no, that's not exactly what he did. He was very upset. Well, not very upset, but he says, look, I'm going to do a miracle in Sarah's 80-year-old, 85-year-old body, and I'm going to bring about a child from her, and that's going to be the heir, because this is going to be the miracle that I do. And that's exactly what happens. 13, 14 years later, Sarah becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son named Isaac, and he's the child of promise. And then one day, again, age disparity, 13 years old and, and 13 years one day, Sarah sees Isaac and Ishmael playing together, and something about the way that they're interacting scared her. We don't really know what it was. We don't know if it was violent, if it was abusive, if it was just teasing, whatever it was. She realized that Ishmael is a threat to her son, and it's legitimate. Ishmael could have inherited everything from Abraham and killed Isaac, just to make sure there was no questions about who and what was in charge. And so Sarah goes to Abraham and says, you've got to send him away. And God goes to Abraham and says, she's right, you've got to send him away. And so they send Hagar and Ishmael away. God takes care of them both. He doesn't abandon them at all. And that's another story for another day. But Paul is saying here in uh, verse 28 that essentially we are the children of promise. Verse 28, now you brothers like Isaac are children of promise. But just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh, that's Ishmael, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, that's Isaac, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Paul is telling them through this illustration, the people that came up from Jerusalem, they're trying to lead you astray. They're taking the promise away from you. They're Ishmael. Drive them out. Get rid of them. Run them off. That's what he's saying. 
There's a decision here for us as well. We face the exact same decision. Ishmael and Isaac couldn't coexist. The gospel and the Judaizers can't coexist. And the misconceptions we allow ourselves to have and the gospel cannot coexist. One of those things will enslave and entrap you. One of those things will set you free. And what are you going to do? You have got to go through your life confronting every single thing with the truth of the gospel. It can't just be parts of your life that are gospel-oriented. It has to be the whole thing. Otherwise, you're living under misconceptions. You're living under a misconception about what life is all about. And you know how I know this? You know how I know all of this has to come underneath the rule and reign of Christ? It's because Jesus is a newer and better Isaac. He's the true heir. He's the one who was born in supernatural circumstances, just like Isaac was born in supernatural circumstances. So Jesus, born of a virgin, he's the son of God. And he inherits everything. The promises made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Moses, all of them. Guess what? He inherits all of them. He's the heir, the true heir. And all the blessings that come with those things are his. And unfortunately, we're way more like Ishmael than we want to admit because we think of God, I think, the way Ishmael thought of Abraham. Ishmael was just twiddling his thumbs, waiting on Abraham to hurry up and die so he could take all of his stuff. He thought of Abraham as this kindly old man who was out of touch with reality, and that's the way we think of God sometimes. He's a doting father that just lets me do whatever I want to do because he loves me and it's okay. I think you misunderstand who God is. I think you misunderstand what God wants from you. I think we misunderstand God's plan, his purpose, and his character all the time. His love, his mercy, his grace, his wrath, his justice. We misunderstand it all. We misunderstand all of it. And we've been misunderstanding it since Adam and Eve had that first misunderstanding in the garden. And God has every right to do what Abraham did to Ishmael and Hagar. God has every right to do to us what he did to Adam and Eve in the garden to drive us out. And you know what? Jesus, the newer and better heir, comes before him and says, don't drive them out. Drive me out. I'll do that for them. I'll take their place. And that's why he goes to the cross. Isaac goes to the cross for Ishmael so that we can be brought into the family, so that we can be a part of the inheritance, so that we don't have to go into the wilderness apart from God so that we don't have to be misunderstood and live under our misunderstandings anymore. You know what would have happened if Ishmael had gone to Abraham and said, Dad, I don't understand it because I know in our culture the firstborn always inherits, but I can clearly see because you've told me that God has chosen Isaac to be the heir, and so I, lay, I relinquish all claims to the inheritance, and I serve him and him alone. You know what would have happened? Ishmael would have gotten to stay. You have an option today, for those of you that have never done it before, to submit your life to Jesus Christ, to give your life to him, to be the Ishmael that, that could have been, the Ishmael that chose to submit his life to Isaac. You can submit your life to the bigger, the newer, the better Isaac, Jesus Christ, and believe in what he has done for you on the cross. And you can drive out that misconception that you don't need him because you do. But we have other misconceptions as well that we need to drive out. You've got to drive out the misconception that you don't need prayer. You do. You've got to depend on Christ through prayer, always. You've got to drive out the misconception that you're not needed for service because you are. We need your hands. We need your feet. You've got to drive out the misconception that you don't need community. That's why we keep talking about the grow book and all the things that are happening in here. It's not because we're like, well, we've made a bunch of programs we want you to be a part of. That's not it. We want you to be a part of this because we believe that it will help alleviate some of the misconceptions that we have in our lives, and you'll be able to follow Jesus more, better, stronger, more passionately, and you'll be free. What are you going to do? You're going to have misconceptions in your life? Yeah, you can have misconceptions, but are you going to let them stay there? You're going to listen to the voice of the Spirit this morning. And drive them out. Start driving them out so that you can walk with Christ deeper and richer than you've ever done before. Don't listen to flattery. Listen to the critique. It's something you need to do today. Don't retreat. Don't give up. 
keep going and drive it out. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you have given us work to do today. You've given us the task of evaluating our life in the light of your gospel, in the light of your truth. Lord Jesus, thank you for being the Isaac that stood in the way. Thank you for calling us to yourself. And thank you for loving us. I pray that people would make that decision today. We love you, Lord Jesus. It's in your great name we pray. Amen.